afternoon and welcome to the Fitchburg Board of Health meeting on June 2nd at 5 p.m. Uh, the year is 2022. Um, my name is Sandra Knipe and I will be chairing the meeting this evening, this afternoon. Um, we have Ian Murray present and we have our regular chairman, Dr. Bogdasarian, on video and um, he will be present, but he will not be conducting the meeting. Um, calling the meeting to order. Yes, I, I would just say that um, since I am gonna be attending virtually today, um, it, it, I don't think that I'm able to chair the meeting appropriately. So I'm gonna ask that um, Sandy Knipe uh, be made the chair temporarily or the chairman pro tem for, for this meeting. Um, if we need to take a vote on that, I'll, I'll motion, make a motion that uh, she be appointed uh, chairman pro tem for this meeting. Okay, I'll second that motion. I'm in favor. Okay, um, so it's all in favor, it looks like it's gonna pass. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, for the record, and it's recorded in the minutes, that I am doing this only as a temporary um, chairmanship for this evening and that Dr. Bogdasarian will remain the permanent chairman from here on forward. Just wanna clarify that. Okay, um, uh, please be advised that FATV is conducting an audio and video recording of this meeting for public broadcast. Um, also, if you're, um, um, let's see here. Uh, invite anyone in the audience who wishes to speak, so please approach the podium, identify yourself by name um, and address, and uh, identify the agenda item on which you would like to speak, and then you may speak on it for no more than two minutes. Uh, we will be going by the agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is the public forum, and I see that we have another petition from Mrs. Westshe, um, would you like to read your petition? Uh, yes, yeah. since the last meeting on um, April 9th, Dr. Anthony Fauci said people must weigh their own personal risk when it comes to COVID mitigation rather than the government issuing mandates. Two days later on the 11th, Dr. Ashish Jha, the new White House COVID czar, said there is no reason for concern despite rising COVID cases because 95% of Americans have identifiable COVID antibodies in their blood, according to the CDC. Therefore, the Board of Health shall recognize the endemicity of COVID COVID-19 and shall not impose any further COVID-19 mandates. Furthermore, the board shall not issue any mandates relating to any other virus or illness, but instead shall advise the mayor and the public. The mayor is elected by the voters and is accountable to them at the ballot box. The mayor takes a holistic view encompassing economic civil liberties and other considerations, not just the health concerns of the most risk averse. Other communities in Massachusetts successfully give this responsibility to the mayor or select board with the Board of Health serving only an advisory function. Therefore, going forward, the mayor shall be responsible for deciding whether to issue any health mandates in the city. I did discuss this with the mayor at a ward meeting and he did not rule it out. Mr. Mayor, if you are watching at home, the buck should stop with you. Thank you. At this time, I would ask if any of the board members or Dr. Bogdasarian has any discussion or comments to make on the petition. Well, I, shall I? Sure, speak? go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think um, to some extent, Ms. Wedge clarified one of my questions and that is, had she uh, asked the mayor what his thoughts were with respect to that role? Um, uh, I'm somewhat reluctant to make any promises about what the board will or will not do in the future with respect to COVID or as was put to any other virus that might come up. Uh, I don't think anyone can predict what might come to us in the future from COVID or from any other virus and what might be necessary to, to combat that illness uh, in Fitchburg and elsewhere. I, I would be very hesitant to make any promises whatsoever one way or the other uh, as to what might be necessary to do to uh, 
bring uh, these pandemics under control. Um, I, I do agree that um, people should have some responsibility for their own welfare. And I think currently we're certainly making suggestions for safe uh, uh, ways to go about things. But I, I think that um, certainly uh, it, it will be at least currently up to individuals to make up their own minds whether they want to wear masks on in public places or in closed spaces or on airplanes. For now, that, that is up to individual discretion, and we don't have any mandates with respect to that. But I certainly, as I said, wouldn't want to rule out the possibility that something like that might come up in the future. Should there be a, a more aggressive virus, should there be a more dangerous virus, or any other sort of infection that might decide to befall us in this area. So I would be uh, not willing to accept or to make any promises with regard to what we might do in the future. Uh, certainly we'll try to consider and carefully anything that we do as we have in the past. And I think as we have in the past, we would discuss it with the mayor and um, other members of the city council. Yeah. I have a comment, that's okay. Of course. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cham person. Um, uh, regarding Ms. Wetchie's petition, uh, I think it's important to know, uh, for the board to know and for all of us to know that we are mandated uh, by Massachusetts, uh, the state of Massachusetts, okay. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, to respond according to Mass General Law. The Board of Health is uh, mandated by Mass General Law to respond to public health issues, including communicable disease. So the board itself does not have the authority to absolve itself from these mandates in mass general law. So it's, 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 it's a mute point. Okay. Thank you. Um, you've already had your two minutes, Ms. Wedgie. We're not gonna continue this anymore. But I'm not just public forum, I'm a, I'm a petitioner as well. Okay. Uh, Director Curry, I believe you're mistaken because other communities such as Springfield, Greenfield, Montague, they all um, have the uh, Board of Health uh, perform an advisory function only. You're saying they're all wrong? I don't know the charter and setup of those communities' boards of health, but we follow the state mandates. Okay, um, I agree with um, Dr. Bogdasarian. Um, that we hope we don't have to um, have this issue before us again. Um, let's hope that things stay the way they are. Um, and do we need, do we want to take a vote on whether to adopt the petition or not? I'll, I'll make that motion that we are not going to honor Mrs. Weschie's position, uh, petition at this time. I'll second that. I'm in favor. Okay, all in favor. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, next item on the agenda is COVID-19 updates. I believe Victoria Seltzer is on board to go over those issues. Victoria, are you there? I'm, uh, I'm oh. putting her in now. Oh, okay. Um, incidentally, we do have two virtual folks uh, so maybe we should jump to that before we have Victoria's oh, update. I, I didn't know uh, that. That's my fault. I okay. didn't. I wasn't so, doing my um, duties. Yeah, because we want to stick to the agenda. So going back to the public forum, there are two um, two individuals that are uh, on virtually, uh, apparently, who uh, have something to say. The first one is Gina Kahn, and I am going to allow her in at this time. Ms. Carm, I hope I'm saying your name correct. Um, can you hear us? No. You need to unmute. I believe she didn't have anything to say. I believe it was the okay. only one who had something that she wanted to say. Okay, we'll pass Thank on you. to the second one. The second one is Michelle Orfanos. She does have her hand up. Thank you, Dan, by the way. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent, thank you. So, um, great petition. So, my understanding is that 
you know, the citizens are coming to you guys with their concerns, and it would be nice if they were acknowledged and, let, and that you could actually say, hey, you know what, they may have a point here. I understood the gentleman said that he's mandated by Massachusetts law. Massachusetts law authorizes the Board of Health to do two things. A mask mandate is not one of them. So, no, you don't have the authority to do that. So, I would, I, it would behoove you to stay within your scope of practice. Citizens are gearing up for lawsuits. Is this really what the Board of Health of Fitchburg wants? Litigation? Just stay within your scope of practice. Listen to the concerned citizens. Yes, people are responsible to do their own due diligence. They can put on a mask if they want. They can put on three masks if they want. That is not within the authority of the Board of Health to mandate a mask mandate. There's two things. That's not one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Orphimus. We appreciate your comments. Um, is that it for public forum now? That is it for the virtual okay. speakers. All right, very good. Uh, next, we'll move on to the COVID-19 updates with Victoria Seltzer. Hello, Victoria. Hi guys, thank you so much. If it's okay with you, I'm going to leave my camera off because I'm going to share my screen with a PowerPoint slide and I just wanna make sure I'm not gonna have any tech issues doing both. So I'm gonna share my screen and leave my camera off Is that all, if that is all right. That's fine. All right, excellent. All right, so just, just a quick update um, for you guys on where we are at for our COVID update. So we had 122 cases of COVID in Fitchburg for um, the week 523 to 529. So that is uh, last week ending Sunday. Uh, this number of cases, it, it seemed to, seems to have stabilized. So that's a good thing. There were 117 cases for both weeks prior. Um, 117 cases for the week of 5-9 and 117 cases for the week of 5-16. And then the number that I just shared, 122 for the week following. So it seems like things have stabilized, which is great news. Um, positivity rate in the city as of today at 5 p.m., 7.23%. Again, positivity rate, 7.23%. And uh, the state positivity rate, 7.29%. So the city of Fitchburg is just below the state average positivity rate, great sign. Um, I do want to say that, of course, this positivity rate is influenced by testing at home. Um, and there is, of course, quite a lot of home testing going on. So everyone um, should just keep that in mind. The third thing to address is wastewater data. So we have wastewater data going on in the city of Fitchburg. We have four samples analyzed per week. And the results from that wastewater analysis is showing on the screen. Um, just to walk you through how to read this, the first thing that I want to mention is that um, wastewater data should be taken as a trend and not by specific one by one data points. So for example, on this graph of the wastewater data, you will see that there were two points that were higher than, um, than the rest of the trend. So um, that isn't something to worry about. It's just um, look at the trend as a whole. Uh, so on the Y axis, all the way on the left hand side, we have the um, effective virus concentration copies per liter of sewage. And this is the metric that is used for wastewater analysis of COVID. And uh, this is through May 31st, so just a couple of days ago. And uh, while generally we can see that there was um, a, a surge, a, a smaller surge in the spring, um, it's, it's a little tricky to see through this graph just because of those two points that I mentioned earlier on that were higher than the rest. Uh, the, the Y axis is quite large, so it kind of loses the resolution of some of those data. So just wanted to mention that, that is where we are at for wastewater data, and um, we will continue to have that surveillance again paid for the Department of Public Health, as I mentioned a few weeks back. 
hospitalizations as of also May 31st. We had nine COVID patients hospitalized um, at Health Alliance in Lemonster. None of them were in the ICU that I am aware of, at least as of the 31st. And I do not know their status otherwise in terms of um, if they have any underlying health conditions, what their age is, what their vaccination status is, et cetera. All those common questions that folks ask um, of hospitalized COVID patients. Vaccine rate. So our, our rate of fully, fully vaccinated individuals in the city of Fitchburg, and this is for eligible people. So um, people that are over the age of five years old is 67.3%. This is um, in comparison to the state average, 81.5%. So while of course our, our uh, vaccination rate is a bit lower than the state average. We are continuing to make sure that our residents have access to vaccination should they want it, um, especially focusing on our elderly population. We've been having pop-up clinics to make sure that um, our 65 plus population can access uh, vaccination very re readily. Uh, we had a clinic at the Sundial a few weeks ago. We did 40 doses there. We have a clinic tomorrow at Joseph's house and just wanna make sure it, um, I say, because I'm mentioning this clinic, it isn't open to the public. It's just open to residents of Joseph's house. Um, but just to share some data with you guys, we have 30 people registered at that clinic and I'll, I'll let you guys know what ends up happening with that um, in terms of if we get more than are registered. And then the last thing I just want to mention is what um, our crew, what the MPHN COVID response team is up to. And something that um, I'm sure many people have been thinking a lot about is um, how the response to COVID is changing as the pandemic continues to change and as we continue to move into a different phase than we were before. And uh, I think, you know, at this point, people are doing a really great job at notifying their own contacts when they test positive. And this is the case for many people that we speak to. Uh, but I think something to think about as we move beyond the phase in the pandemic where um, contact collection and contact notification is important is the importance of everything else that has been part of this process. Um, for example, social support. So social support is something that um, is a really big focus of our phone calls when we call residents who have tested positive, and this has been the case um, throughout the entire pandemic, but especially now. This includes anything from maybe food, uh, financial assistance, housing, a primary care doctor, health insurance, transportation, anything on the realm of the social determinants of health that um, you might think about. So that is something that remains um, very important. And it's good because while we're helping the residents with these things while they um, currently have COVID, it's something that's making um, a positive impact on their well-being even after they have recovered from their illness. Uh, another thing that um, is important is uh, making sure our residents have access to treatment should they, um, should they be interested in, in pursuing that option. Um, I think something that comes to mind when, when you bring up treatment is, wait, well, what about the primary care doctors? Well, there's a lot of barriers to that. Some people don't have primary care. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get in touch with primary care doctors or any other reason that it might be tough for a resident to access treatment when they need it, especially those that are at higher risk for severe illness, whatever, for whatever reason that may be. Uh, so that is another thing that um, we are putting a lot of focus on when we are doing these calls to our residents is making sure people know about the options for treatment and help them access it should they need that type of support. And then uh, another thing, and just, just picking a couple of examples of things that we do is helping people access um, vaccination. I had, <laughs> to use my own experience here, I had a family member call me the other day uh, she, she needed her booster shot and she said, I can't figure out the CVS website. Can you help me schedule it? And that is something that we do when we are on our calls as well with our residents who have tested positive. Um, if, they, if they choose that they would 
like um, to get vaccinated, whether it's first dose, second dose, or booster, then that is absolutely something that we offer to help with. So that way they are, there are no barriers um, to accessing vaccination when needed. I think that is all I have for you guys. So I will go ahead and pause here if anyone has any questions for me. How many, um, Victoria, this is Sandy, how many are you, calls are you making um, throughout the MPHN region? Yeah, that is a really good question, Sandy. And I think uh, it's a difficult one to answer because it really depends on um, what happens when we are calling people. Um, when we call people, we call them once and um, leave a voicemail and they can choose to call us back. And if they don't call us back, then that is okay too. Um, but when we are calling people, we are first always making sure that the residents that are over 60 are receiving a phone call from us because those would be the highest priority for making sure that uh, they have access to treatment should that be something that is appropriate for them. Uh, so I don't know the specific number off of the top of my head on how many calls we made uh, recently, but I do have a number that I meant to share with you guys and it totally just slipped my mind on resource coordination, which I just talked about. So this works out well. Uh, so from April 1st to May 24th, we did um, over 400 resource referrals for our residents. Uh, this includes anything from Again, financial assistance or the, the most common resource needs of the 400, I should say. Financial assistance, so um, people needing help with rent. Uh, utilities is a big one. Food, um, vaccine appointments, which I mentioned, treatment, test kits. So those were the uh, five most common resource needs in our communities. Um, but beyond the five, we're, we also see other things, um, for example, someone needing help with um, getting a primary care doctor. So just the other day, uh, we had a resident who I believe was in his 70s maybe, didn't have a primary care doctor. We picked that up when we were doing our resource assessment when we were on his call and um, our care resource coordinator uh, set him up with a primary care and he has an appointment, his first appointment with his primary care doctor next week. Um, so that's just one of the success stories that I came across recently. Um, so doesn't answer your question, Sandy, but gives you a different number at least to go off of. Great. Thanks, Victoria. Yeah, of course. Anybody have any comments? Ian, Dr. Bogdasarian, are you still with us? Uh, I'm just going to ask for an update. I could have missed it, but an update in terms of vaccination rates in Fitchburg. Uh, how many people have received um, you know, two two uh, shots of either Moderna or Pfizer, and how many people have had various boosters? Do, do we have that figure? Yeah, definitely. So um, the two dose rate, so fully vaccinated rate in the city is 67.3. And the state average for that same metric, so two doses of over for over five-year-olds is 81.5. So city average, 67.3. State average, 81.5, and I believe the booster rate is about 52%, if I'm remembering that correctly off the top of my head. Okay, that 62% would be 62% of the people who got the first two shots or 62% of the population in general? So it would be 52% of people who are eligible. So I believe that would reflect the people who res received the first two the, their primary series, so one dose of the Johnson & Johnson or two doses of either one of the mRNA vaccines. Gotcha, thanks. Of course. All set, everybody? Yeah, set. Okay. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. Nice job. Thanks, everyone. Very nice job. Um, next on the agenda is um, the request for a hearing with Brian Mahoney, which has been resolved. The what? issue has been resolved. Okay. That is correct. So we don't need to discuss any more with that. Number five, um, approval of the minutes from April 7th. 
Uh, I just reviewed them myself. So um, do we, can we vote on those? I, I read them as well. I, I can vote on them. Okay. <laughs> I can too. So I'll make a motion that we approve the meeting minutes of April 7th, 2022, as is. I'll second. And I'm in favor also. Okay, motion carries. Nice job on the minutes. Yes, nice job on the, as always. Those were some long minutes, and I like how you broke them down. Thank Looked you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, next is the fiscal 23 uh, department budget discussion. If I may, uh, you Ms. May. Chairman. Director Curry, you may. Um, uh, just so uh, folks are aware, uh, the uh, initial um, budget, citywide budget, uh, was presented to the city council on Tuesday evening, uh, as well, it was within the, uh, the whole citywide, of course, was uh, the Board of Health uh, budget. Uh, so I believe the councilors have a week or two uh, to make their proposal for cuts or um, <laughs> have discussions with department heads. Um, I have not been approached by any counselors as of yet, but um, just an update on our budget since uh, we haven't seen each other for a few weeks. Um, I refer to page 13 in the packet if that's helpful. And basically um, I will go over um, each category within the department uh, briefly, uh, and I will point out uh, changes uh, from uh, FY, FY22 versus FY23. I'm certainly open to questions, but I don't want to bore you with um, information that you don't want to hear. Um, starting off, I will uh, begin with the health department personal services. Um, some of the uh, changes, pr or proposed changes, uh, an inspector retired, um, uh, a housing inspector retired just about a year ago. Um, and it just so happened that the uh, inspectional services were in union negotiations. Uh, so I did propose to the uh, SEIU, which local 88, 888, which is the inspector's union, uh, to remove, um, that inspector's position and make it a management uh, position, um, either a deputy director or assistant director of public health uh, to assist me in uh, running the department. Uh, the department has grown exponentially. Uh, that person would also be responsible to uh, assist me with overseeing the inspectional uh, and all the duties of uh, inspections to make sure that uh, our mandates are being met. Uh, so that is a proposal. The salary has not changed. It would be based on the actual retirement of the previous inspector, which I probably should note, uh, Inspector Michael Burns left us a little less than a year ago. Um, he gave us uh, 27 years of service, uh, so I think we probably should uh, note that uh, out loud, that uh, of uh, all he contributed in his 27 years. In addition, we have proposed to uh, uh, add a principal clerk, our, no offense to the current principal clerk stenographer, but our uh, crew is aging as well as I, and uh, I feel uh, the retirements are impending uh, with our crew, so it's time we start uh, trying to address the young uh, and try to get some um, younger clerks in and try to help out with all the expanding duties of the of the clerks in the last year. I, I don't remember how many grants, but it's about 10, I think, somewhere around 10 uh, grants that we are managing. Uh, and the two clerks have managed to handle it on their own, but it's growing and growing, and um, technology is picking up, so we need to, I feel we need to keep up at that pace. Um, about 80% of that, it might even be more, uh, is totally grant funded, so there is not a lot of expense uh, to the city uh, to keep that. Uh, I would like some city expenses to remain in the 34,000, uh, just so that that person can absolve some of the city duties from our two present clerks. Some of the other changes, um, our public health excellence grant, which just uh, was received this week, 
uh, requires us to hire a full-time inspector. It's a regional inspector. It would be covering the 13 towns, um, and that's a full-time position. So that's basically the salary you see at the recycling, I'm sorry, uh, at the regional sanitary code inspector position. Other changes, um, emergency personal services was basically uh, or nurses overtime in FY22, uh, basically time spent contact tracing and, and various COVID activities. It uh, basically was broken down, uh, I believe, so that the car, uh, city could uh, reimburse itself uh, for FEMA and uh, we will no longer utilize that $20,000 in FY23. The other uh, changes are some of the grants. Um, CDBG outreach, outreach, we not only have code enforcement CDBG funds, we now have street outreach funds and street outreach funds are uh, um, dedicated to a couple of individuals that we have uh, right now are contracted. Uh, they're out uh, addressing substance abuse uh, issues as well as homeless issues in our population. Um, we will be talking about that much more in the near future, that program, it's really taken off. Um, many people have uh, gone to treatment, however, it's gonna be a constant problem when, and we realize that uh, and we will continue to address that. Um, Another new grant, and you see in the list of grants, is the ARPA funds uh, from the state. That's $100,000. That also supports street outreach. We do also do have around $128,000 of local Fitchburg ARPA funds. That is also dedicated to street outreach. I already did mention the Public Health Excellent Grant. Um, and there's also the Community Foundation Grant. Uh, I wanna acknowledge those folks. Uh, gave us about $30,000. Um, and that is basically geared towards our homeless folks and trying to get them into housing uh, and temporary housing um, where necessary. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of funds have come in in, in the last period and, and most of them have come in. I believe this budget was designed somewhere around January and February. Most of them come in after that, so you don't even see them on here, but uh, hopefully we'll have more discussions on that and I will update the board as we go. Before I move on to the next category, should I stop here and ask for questions or? No, I'm glad you acknowledge the um, outreach people though. Okay, moving on, health expenses. Um, changes from 22 to 23 proposed. Uh, we're, we're still seeking a wage and weights and measures inspector. Uh, luckily, the state of Massachusetts uh, Division of Standards was able to cover us for this year. Uh, they no longer want to do that. Uh, they're willing to help, but they don't want to do it. Um, we did post it uh, a couple of months ago, didn't get a lot of interest in it. It will be reposted again very shortly, and hopefully we will have somebody in place um, for FY23. Hey, may I ask a question in regards to the weights and measures? Yes, you may. Why can't we share one with Lemonster? <clears throat> that is, is, uh, is an option. Because um, they have one. They do. Yes. They actually have three, I believe. Well, and they're all part-time. The well. well, they're all part-time, and that's the problem. I don't think any of them really want to go full-time, but I will definitely, okay. it's been about uh, a year since I've talked to them about it, so I definitely will take that idea and... Uh, Ask them again if anything has changed. But last I knew, none of them wanted to be full time. And it would require a full time person to do both jobs. Well, between over there and half time here, um, it it would create uh, probably a forty hour a week job between the two places. Yeah. So I'm it's not. I'm open it's to trying thought. again. Okay. Uh, and again. Um, the other drastic change you see in the expenses, um, one is mileage. Uh, basically that is uh, inspectors driving around the city. Uh, we've been short uh, down an inspector for uh, almost a year now, so, and we've uh, have a, had a shortage in the housing department, so that's the real difference in the mileage from FY22 to 23. 
And then the other drastic change is the contract of weights and measures. And basically that is the total we pay to the state uh, for them to do the job. Um, so that's really the large differences from FY 22 to 23 in the health expenses. I'll stop there if there's any questions or concerns. The next page is public health nurses. Um, not a lot of drastic change within the public health school. Uh, there is one school nurse uh, in the health budget. Um, our public health nurse actually receives a stipend to cover uh, the regional, which is the MPHN, Communicable Disease, uh, MAVEN reports, um, but really no change there. Uh, the only drastic changes are the vaccine coordinator shows up now in the budget. Uh, we are funded for the vaccine coordinator beyond FY22 to the end of FY23. So a full year uh, for that position. That position is 100% covered by the best value grant, which you see below. And then there is the COVID-19 response unit, which is uh, basically Victoria's unit. Um, and I've just been formed, informed by the state that that is also funded for 240,000 beginning in FY23. Uh, that, uh, our current setup will not get us, uh, the 240,000 will not get us through the full year. Uh, so we're going to have to be creative uh, on that. And then that's really the only drastic changes within the public health nurse. I'll stop if there's any questions. I'll keep going if there's not. Keep going. <laughs> the last page, page 16, is our uh, Board of Health Rubbish collection and disposal, as well as the closed maintenance fund, closed landfill maintenance fund. Um, the contract fees are the collection portion. Um, I know that uh, our collection hasn't been valiant in the last year, maybe year plus. However, there has been an, uh, an increase in the uh, contractual services. Um, it's it's sort of expected that um, uh, COVID has created gas prices. Well, I don't know if COVID created that, but our gas prices are high, our, our, our vehicle prices are high, so their expenses are high, so they've raised the rates. Uh, I've found that that is not uncommon to just about any community. They've, all the waste haulers have approached the communities to raise the rates in the mm -hmm. contracts. So you see a 7% increase in the contract fees, which is collection. There is also a 7% increase in the contract services, which is disposal at the landfill. Um, hopefully we'll begin to see uh, employees at our, our uh, their empl employee base expand uh, as well as new equipment come on, uh, we are in the final year of our uh, collection contract, uh, so hopefully things will improve. Uh, either way, we do go out to bid in FY23. I do know that um, I am forced quite often to cease yard waste to make sure that trash and collection, uh, yard waste collection, I need to cease that at times. Uh, it's very unpopular, I understand that, but it's also uh, very uh, important that I get the trash and the recycling off the streets, uh, priority. Um, we will do our best to track those yard waste misses. I am aware that they are out there and we will send the contractor back to get those services taken care of. As far as the closed landfill fund, um, it was cut by the mayor in FY23. Um, but I think it will, uh, uh, after further review, I think that uh, it will come back. Uh, we do have numerous amounts of old landfills in the city. Uh, one that has um, reared its ugly head recently is the one that AKS Recycling operates on. 
Um, we're going to be required to do some environmental monitoring on that site. Um, and there is a proposal to DEP to get groundwater and gas monitoring on that site. Um, so I think it's important that uh, we fund that line item uh, and that that line item meets the requirements of the state DEP and that we put a proposal together once we have an idea of what that uh, monitoring uh, system will cost. Uh, we need to commit uh, annually to keeping those services going. Uh, I, it's not going to be as bad as I thought because AKS has been a tremendous help in putting uh, up the program together, um, but we're not going to have that program on the other numerous landfills that pop up here and there uh, back from the before landfills were heavily regulated. Is that a closed landfill? Closed it landfill is. fund. And we have, has anyone been monitoring that over the years? It is a very new line item. I just started okay. requesting it back. Yeah. back uh, FY22 is the first year I requested it. Okay. So um, no one's monitored it at all since they closed it? I thought DEP had you monitor them. Well, D many of these landfills were closed before DEP. Oh, really? Yes. Um, so they, all but the current landfill operating, they were all closed to DEQE regulations before the 70s. Uh, regulations obviously have come a long way since the 1970s. So they met the closing requirements in 1970, but uh, requirements are changing drastically. So now the that after they've been level. closed for 20, 30, all these years, they want to start monitoring them again? Yes. Just, okay. Yes, uh, hopefully we're past uh, the methane period um, but who knows what, what uh, these landfills have done to groundwater. I know other communities have run into PFAS. Um, it's becoming very popular. It's the new contaminant for drinking water. PFAS? PFAS. PFAS. What yeah. is that? Polyfluoro. <laughs> I'd have to go. It's okay. polyfluoro, uh, basically a chemical used in processing uh, like wax paper. Um, is it considered a VOC? Yes. Okay, we need to watch it. And it, it has, it has uh, levels of in drinking water limits. So I, I think we may run into a jam with uh, under the new contaminated. Uh, we're about 80% uh, municipal drinking water in the city. Uh, there still is that portion of 20% that is on wells that we need to protect. And that is the budget for FY23. Thank you, Director Curry. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments on the budget? No. No? And seeing none, then we can move on to announcements from the Board of Health members and Health Department. If I may take the floor again, Ms. You Chairman? You may, Director Curry. Yes, you may. So uh, just a f reminder to folks, on June 11th is our uh, first of two 2022 Household Hazardous Waste Collection Days. Um, these, um, these events are very important uh, to make sure that these hazardous waste materials do not to get in our drinking water. Uh, so please, this is a free service. Uh, any questions, contact the office. It is on the webpage. Um, the Household Hazardous Waste Day. Uh, it does list what is considered household hazardous waste. I will not go over this lengthy list, uh, but it, like as I said, it's a free service. Please utilize it. Um, it does happen twice a year, um, and I know things sit around in folks' garages and sheds, uh, so take a look to see what you have in, in those storage areas and, and try to get uh, proper disposal. Anyway, it runs on June 11th. It's from 9 to 12, uh, which is a Saturday. And it's located at our Fitchburg Westminster Landfill, which is uh, Route 31 South, 101 Fitchburg Road in Westminster. Next, we have uh, another Narcan and overdose prevention community training. Um, it's an in-person training, and it will be held on Thursday, June 16th, right here in the legislative building. There will be resource tables and light 
refreshments at 6 p.m. and at 6.30 the training begins and it's open to the community. Uh, there's no pre-registration and Narcan will be distributed to attendees. Uh, folks can contact the office uh, for any questions if, if there are some questions. 978-829-1870 is the office number. And the third item of announcement and final, I just want to reiterate to folks that uh, ongoing still, our vaccine coordinator is conducting clinics at the Fitchburg Public Library uh, on the second and fourth Friday of every month, 2.30 to 4.30, and uh, presently Pfizer is available. Dosages are available to folks five and up. You do not need to register, uh, it's walk-in. Uh, bring your vaccine vaccine card, very helpful. Um, and then also t we have $25 market bis basket gift cards available on a first come first serve basis to those who get vaccinated. And those are my announcements for the evening. Very good. Um, it you. looks like that concludes our agenda for this evening. Uh, we'd like to set our next meeting for July, um, any requests? I well, will not be here for the first week of July. That's the fourth anyway, but you don't need me. Um, yeah, the only, um, actually the only Thursday that I'm gonna be here in July is the last one, the 28th. But Sandy, you've done such a wonderful job. You can uh, go ahead without me if you need to. <laughs> She's, she's not available either. Well, I'm not available for the first week. I'll, I'll be, I'll may be I gone. May I propose an August meeting? Um, let's do that. Let's, pre let's uh, schedule to meet in August unless something of an emergent nature comes up and we can handle it as it comes. So that would be August when the, the uh, 4th, August 4th? August 4th. Is that me with you, John? Fourth, fourth works is fine for me, yes. Okay. August 4th is good. Right. Get I'll, used to this. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. <laughs>